Hello, Moto Rider World fans, and welcome to this episode of Talking Moto GP uh, with myself, Rob Portman, and a very special guest that I've got, my best mate in the entire world, Sheridan Marais, has joined us. Shez, how are you doing? Hello, guys. Nice to see you all. Well, nice to have you see me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, doing good. Eh? Uh, missing home, been in Europe for a while, but yeah, doing good. Thank you. So this is basically just, uh, uh, you know, obviously there was no racing the last couple of weeks as we preempt the weekend that's coming into Kota. Just um, a little chat with myself and Shez. Shez, funnily enough, this was the first ever MotoGP race that Shez has been to since Paquisa 2001 or whenever the last Paquisa MotoGP race was. So Shez was at the Portuguese uh, round in Portimao. So we just thought after a couple of weeks ago when we had that conversation with Paul Stewart, um, a lot of people saying would love to hear from Shez and get his perspective on, on what he saw and, and what he thought. So that's why we've kind of put this together. We can kind of talk about the, the Port Tomorrow and leading into, into the Kota weekend and some of the other happenings that, has, that, have, that have happened outside the MotoGP paddock. But Shez, let's start off first of all with a bit of talking. Shez, you've, as you said, you've been away from home for, for, for quite a long time now. What, what have you been up to? Yeah, um, a big trip with me doing two championships this year. I'm doing the World Endurance with Wojciech uh, Racing Team, the team I've been with the, since uh, 2020. Um, they've changed over to Honda from Yamaha. Um, so we'll be riding the new Fireblade um, in the World Endurance Championship. And then I'm also doing the IDM, the German Superbike Championship, so in the Superstock class. So um, I have come o- I came over really early, like beginning of March, just before my, our birthdays. And, um, yeah, I've been here since then just doing a lot of testing and stuff. But, um, yeah, I think of the 10 or 12 days we've had of actual track time, I've been able to ride like two or three days because the weather's been atrocious here. Mm. So, um, yeah, still still good to be riding and, yeah, uh, traveling up and down. Um, my new German team have been, like, uh, very hospitable and they've had me over – in Cologne and taking me out to see Depeche Mode. I mean, that's your era, so so you'll know them pretty well. <laughs> um, so that was really cool. And um, yeah, hanging out with Paolo yeah, in um, in Portugal. So yeah, done a bit of riding at least. And um, yeah, just getting the year together and can't wait to go before Le Mans in two weeks. So that, that, that's the first race of the season. That's the, the season opener then for you in World Endurance. That's right, yeah. And the twenty, the race is the twentieth and twenty-first of April, the Le Mans twenty-four hour. And you've been on a, the Yamaha for a while now. And we know the Yamaha, in many ways, a little bit long in the tooth. I know you guys had a lot of technical problems, especially in world endurance racing. Yacht, I know, won the championship last year, but I think it was more da- <clears throat> down to some other teams' failings because the Yamaha has reliability issues in in those endurance races you know it's with that big bang cross plane it's not exactly it, it is a high revving engine but it's not supposed to be a high high revving engine um how does the honda feel compared to the yamaha and how do you think you're going to compete this year yeah i mean the level in the world endurance is so high now that everyone's like kind of pushing the boundaries so and the yamaha for endurance racing is already on the boundary in terms of longevity you know the engines just don't withstand that kind of pressure for so long so um riding the honda now um it's so fast just out the box so i mean i love the yamaha and i've always had a good relationship with yamaha and and so on and so forth so but um yeah the, the actual the reason for the team moving to honda was actually just just support and um how can i say it um politely uh just yeah yamaha weren't giving them what they expected and um honda's now honda poland is actually helping them a hell of a lot and yeah, just going to make a life a lot easier for the team and a lot um, more cost effective, not having to build engines every round for for practice and for racing and for everything, you know. So these Hondas, we can afford, because they make so much horsepower, we can afford to just run completely stock engines and, yeah, hope they last. I mean, that's endurance racing, but, yeah. So, so yeah, we'll see. Um, I think it's a good thing because, like I say, the, I mean, for endurance, having all this horsepower does help a lot. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm sad to be not on, be on a Yamaha because, like I said, I've always had a close relationship with them. But yeah, the fact is, we're on Honda, and I'm looking forward to it for sure. I haven't I haven't written the new Blade, but obviously read all the press releases and the, the reviews, especially here in the UK, where they've just kind of had the world launch not so long ago. And um, yeah, big big things coming out of there. I know still in World Superbikes, Honda are battling. 
uh, and, 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 but as a production version, or for your kind of rules of racing, that Honda seems like a really good package. Yeah, I think, I mean, it was, it's been a long story for BMW of the same thing. Um, as a super, I believe, and you know this, I believe World Superbike should be super stock rules anyway. There's MotoGP for all these prototype parts and all that. I mean, a World Superbike, if you put the MotoGP tires on, it's going to be doing the same lap times as MotoGP. So, um, yeah, I believe the World, World Championship, World Superbike rules should be super stock anyway, if it's production based. Um, but yeah, in, in the stock form, the Honda's really shining. Um, like I say, the BMWs faced that problem for many years, and I think it still does. It's just top rec that's um, it's uh, above above everyone else. But yeah, when you bolt on all those special parts and prototype parts and swing arms and all the shit, then yeah, they 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 tend to battle. But I mean, I think it was Spanish Championship this past weekend or Italian or whatever. One of them, I just saw Hondas were ruling all the podium positions, so and on different tires as well. So. Um, it's a good a good um, sign um, for things to come, and I think I mean there's not a it was it wasn't um, flagged to be a massive change from the 2023 to the 2024 model, but there has been big big changes, especially to the electronics, which is what they struggled with. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately for World Superbikes, they don't they run a completely different package. Um, so yeah, for us running these HRC electronics. Um, I don't like it, but yeah, for the competitiveness of what we're racing against, um, the 2024 bike is a good step forward, yeah. Oh, well, I'm excited. Everyone in the comment section, yeah, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Also, very excited to hear from you, see you. We don't get to see you and hear from you as much as uh, we'd all like to. Um, so it's great to have this. Uh, Emil Brand, hi, Robin, shares from Tiny's Pit Box in Cape Town. So shout out there to uh, Tiny's Pit Box in Cape Town. Stephen Berry's in the house, Luca Jefferson. All the usuals are in the house. Um, so shares, before we get into MotoGP, let's quickly just touch upon uh, World Superbikes because, you know, me and you have always shared a, a big passion for World Superbikes. Yeah. Um, and, and looking at it now, w w apart from Top Rack doing what he's doing on the BMW, which I think is great, I'm glad he made that move. It, it, it's brought a nice freshness to the paddock, Andrea Iannone's brought a nice freshness to it. Sam Lowe's, even though he led a couple of laps and crash. There's so many great factors that have come into World Superbikes. Yeah. One thing that I picked up on is obviously with a new ruling that that probably if you were racing World Superbikes would have hit you with this rider weight limit because, um, you know, I wasn't really for it and I didn't understand it because I kind of looked at it the same as rugby. If Okay, well, that guy's small and light, so he runs faster than me. That's not fair. You must put five kilo or a 20 kilo backpack on him you know yeah stupid but anyway scott redding was one of the main protagonists and i and i mean this in the nicest way because again I, it's easy to talk about riders outside <clears throat> the paddock and on shows like this i've met scott redding he's he's a great guy uh chatted to him he gave me some mm -hmm. items for for nova's auction a couple of years ago and that's so i want to try and play my words nicely here but he was one of the guys that came out and went well if if, if we were the same size on the same box, I'd be winning. And that's what yeah. kind of brought this whole thing about, you know. Uh, Petrucci yeah. has kind of voiced it before, but, you know, not as much as Scott Redding. Yeah. So Alvaro Batista now, after a couple of races, getting used to the extra seven kilos goes and wins now, which I thought was brilliant. And I loved what he said. You know, when you win like the way he has, when you haven't been winning and everything's up against you, it makes winning even better. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he did it spectacularly. And I think he's just going to go win it again now that he's got everything sorted. My argument is nothing has changed with Scott Redding. So how much does this actually play? Even Petrucci to a point, that, that's where they're going to finish. No matter where, how much extra weight you have on, how much anything, that is where they're going to finish. So yeah, I don't know. It just frustrates me when I see that. And I haven't seen any real difference other than Batista, who was genetically born a small man and a tiny yeah. figure, you know, just getting thrashed with all these stupid. No, things. exactly. I think that's that's the biggest pile of horseshit that the weight is actually the fact. I mean, that's I think the biggest thing that, that he's been struggling with is just trying to actually because they're obviously riding at the at 110 percent. You know, the level is just so high now that. A change to the bark is actually what's making him slower. It's not a fact that it's the weight. It's just an actual change to the bark. So I think once they get that set up, you're just going to see the same. Once they get him comfortable and stable um, with that weight on the bark, he's just going to do exactly the same thing. Um, maybe his teammates a bit closer or top rack now that he's got a little bit of horsepower. But, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like you say, you want to word it nicely so that guys don't catch feelings. But um, the reality is that 
people like Scott have been spoon fed the entire life. Um, I know lots of guys that, that are good guys that aren't that aren't um how can you say um brat and arrogant mm -hmm. and all that that are from England and the UK. Mm -hmm. And they'd also got spoon fed because just the reality is that their countries can support them. If they show the slightest bit of um, talent, their countries are paying for them to take this ride and that ride and MotoGP and Moto3 until they eventually cr crack it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with a, a, a guy like him is that he's got this chip on his shoulder, just like this past weekend. He said that, um, yeah, for a change now, I mean, first of all, he couldn't understand why they took top rack. I mean, the whole world could understand why they took top rack because he's not on his level. But yeah, he vocally um, on social media and that was saying, yeah, it doesn't make sense while they're taking top rack because essentially he's a better rider. Um, then this past weekend in wherever, wherever their last race was, uh, Barcelona, top rack, I mean, he head and shoulders above everyone on a BMW. Um, and then after the weekend, he gives him a little bit of credit saying, yeah, he, he really surprised him after the weekend, but um, he's going to be, but, but Scott can beat him. He says, I can, but I can beat him. I will beat him, actually, I think. Um, and the reality is there's no chance. When Scott was on, I, I do think that Ducati is the best bike. I mean, yeah. Batista, the, the best rider, I think, in, in the championship, but he's also on the best bike. Um, but, yeah, when Scott was on the best bike, he was up there and winning the odd race and that and challenging. But I think that set a false, how can I say this, false idea of where he levels at in his mind. Mm -hmm. um, everyone just watching and seeing it go the way it's going um, can see that it's, it's not the case, but um, not to take away from his ability and his, yeah. his talent and all these things, but yeah, a bad attitude doesn't doesn't help the support um, for him. Eh? You know, I think what Ducati have highlighted in, in both World Superbikes and MotoGP is um, that a, a, the, the package can make a big difference. And sometimes, like you say, just kind of, sweeten the deal and sweeten the actual talent a, a little bit if you look in now um Ertl in 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 world superbike you know he was on a go 11 ducati last year put in the odd decent ride and you know showcase himself well the yamaha this year just not the same kind of rider um luke marini moto gp i kind of always said you know i like marini um yeah is he moto gp quality and when he started putting in good performances on the ducati kind of said okay well he's doing well but yeah yeah well i mean now now that we're comparing i mean just quickly before we go to the gp stuff um look at johnny johnny ray actually i take that back i said bautista's a rider I, I believe johnny ray is the best rider but look at him going to a honda uh the yamaha which i do think is a better bike than what he was riding on the kawasaki but just that change the guys are i mean again i do rate him as the best world super bike rider but he's running around mid-pack now. I mean, being beaten by many Yamahas, just from a change to a different manufacturer, a better one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like I said, it just goes to my point that the level's so high that, in my opinion, the weight makes no difference. When I was teammates with Kenan Sofoglu, I was like a skinny skinny 600 rider at 57 or 56 kilos, and Keenan was just Keenan at 74 kilos, and he could pass me down the straight, I could pass him down the straight. There was no difference on a 600. So um, yeah, I believe this this weight thing on the super box is oh, I think it's it's rubbish anyway. But um, yeah, I just like I say, once Batista gets that base set up of he's happy because of this extra weight he's got on the bark and himself. Um, I think it's just going to be the the same thing. Maybe a little bit closer with his teammate and that, but um, yeah, I think it'll be the same thing. Yeah, I think what we can take from it is, uh, apart from all that kind of bullshit nonsense in the background, is World Superbikes is definitely uh, really excited. Like, I'm so excited. I'm going to head to Essen in a couple of weeks' time. I'm like, World Superbikes has sparked me again. You know, it went kind of through. Yeah. Last year, I was excited. You know, watching Batista in action is is great, but watching Top Rack, they got some names. But yeah. You, are, you add in Ian Noni and and those yeah. kind of that bully I mean, guys. Ever since Donna took it over from FG Sport, it's been pretty boring, let's be honest. Um, since the Bayless and Edwards and Hodgson and all these guys' days, um, <clears throat> it's been pretty boring. I mean, the odd good race and that, or most of the time, Johnny just winning everything, and or Batista winning everything. But now it's, yeah, it's, it's super exciting, nice and close. So like you say, I think it's, um, I mean, it gets put on the back foot by Donna purposefully. So And, and, and to be honest, MotoGP is taking a limelight deservedly. But yeah, it's making a comeback. I think um, hopefully it can be as strong as the FG Sport days. Yeah. So let's move across then to, to MotoGP. Um, you were a guest of 
And I remember this from 2016. <clears throat> we did we did that live meet and greet with Brad Binder. He just won his Mario Three World Championship. Uh, we did it at Ridgeway Race Bar. Um, a lot of people came out. You know, we were all there. And I remember Greg Maloney, who was emceeing the night, said to Brad Binder, so who's your favorite rider of all time? Mm. And he kind of looked down at you and he went, Sheridan Marais. And I still kind of slapped him in the face and said, but I'm sitting right next to Shares. What about me? <laughs> anyway, he said, Sheridan. And, and he's always he's always had this massive respect for you. You know, every time I see him, he always, how's Shares doing? And, you know, he, he, he's always had this, he's always kind of been this fanboy of Shares. So he invites you to Portimao because you were in Portimao with Paul. Um, so you were a guest of, of of Brad's and the KTM team for your first ever proper MotoGP weekend. Forget yeah, about yeah. that. Um, let, let's talk about that now. So you obviously got to to do some service roads to so stand a little bit closer uh, on the yeah. side of the track and see and, and, and hear all kind of things. And this is what I want to pick from you now, because certainly when I went over and I, and I had that access, I learned so much more about MotoGP and the riders and the riding styles and how the bikes work. You know, you can hear how the, the different electronics work on the different bikes and how the riders are standing it up more and take their lines. And yeah. it, it really just fascinated me, the different world, that when you add a MotoGP weekend compared to watching it on TV. So let's start off with, with Pedro Acosta, which is which is obviously a big conversation. Now, you sent me the voice note after the Portimao weekend because you weren't able to join us on the show. You were driving to Valencia. And you were saying, you made a very no, a good note that I kind of, I could see, but I didn't take much of it because I, I was kind of, okay, well, I wonder if anyone else sees it. But Pedro's got this riding style where he brakes very upright, but he yeah. keeps the bike straight, straight for as, as long as possible. Then he puts it in, but he doesn't put it in with this massive amount of lean angle. He like just, yeah. it's almost, and, and I hate saying this, and anyone who's asked me this question, and I've, I've joked with you about it. Mm. I say I don't like to waste time in a corner. I mean, I, I'm, I don't. I've never scraped my elbow. I hardly ever scraped my knee. I'm useless when it comes to <laughs> lean angle. Like I fail miserably in that. I always like to break late, get it in, and get it out. And, and yeah, yeah. But I didn't get that corner speed kind of balance right. But yeah. Pedro seems to to have this balance right now. And thinking about it after you mentioned those notes and watching it more, I'm thinking now. And 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 with how fast Pedro Costa is going. I'm thinking we're we're seeing this change that Mark 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 Marquez brought into MotoGP all those years ago in 2013. Yeah, yeah. When he kind of right, he said, right, this is how you've got to ride a MotoGP bike now, and that's what yeah. Pedro Acosta is doing because, like you said and Paul said, we've all said on the show, this guy's got no kind of spec sheet on how to ride a MotoGP bike. No, no. I no, mean, no. on his own, he's just gone. Okay, well, I don't want to see that sheet. I'm going to ride this thing yeah. how how I, how I want to ride it. So. Give us a little bit of, of insight of what, what you were seeing on the side of the track, specifically with Pedro Acosta that impressed you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's typical of a confident rider. No one can tell me anything kind of thing. Oh. Um, and, I mean, it's not good to have an attitude like that when talking to people like the guy we just spoke about, Reading. But, yeah, um, to to have that in your to be humble in in person but to be to ride like you do you know you don't nobody can teach you anything um in your head just headstrong um i i just think that's what he's doing um he's not going by the book and like you know like i'm get what i'm getting at is that a confident rider doesn't doesn't want to listen to anybody and he's just going there and riding a bike to how he feels is the fast way and yeah i definitely noticed i mean i I spent my life at tracks and stuff, so I mean, I didn't hang around in the pits and stuff. Like, I, I don't enjoy that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I spent all the time on in the GP in the GP sessions was always like track side on that. So it was re that that I enjoyed, and um, it was pretty notice noticeable. I mean, Brad's probably since he since he started in GP, um, I would say that Brad's probably been one of the fastest enters en entry entry guys into the corners. Mm -hmm. um and pedro it was more noticeable in the race obviously because they were together but even in practice i noticed i noticed it already but in the race i noticed it massively especially when pedro was behind him is that you know brad usually from the front is actually gapping people on the mm -hmm. brakes or, or not necessarily on the brakes but corner entry mm -hmm. and pedro was quite a few times near running into him and closing him and i just noticed i mean i think i do think that brad and him had difficulties on on corner entry, it looked like engine brake or something like that, because the usual style for Brad and Miller to an extent is is the backing in. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they, their bikes weren't really backing in. They were backing in, but then chopping a little bit in that, whereas Pedro's bike was backing in um, like their bikes usually do. Mm-hmm. And um, so he was definitely gaining on corner entry. But like, like, like you've just mentioned already, I noticed that on the brakes, he keeps the bike so much more upright than everyone else, which obviously allows you, because you haven't got a lean angle, there's way less pressure on that front tie of, um, of sliding. So yeah, it's, it's it's a logical way around. I mean, no one else is doing it quite to quite the extent of him, but yeah, he was definitely making it work. I mean, he carries the lean angle and he scrapes his elbow and shoulder in the fast corners and where it's necessary. But yeah, I noticed in the breaking the breaking areas, he was which was quite yeah impressive and definitely notably different <clears throat> to everyone else. I do think the KTM's do suit that because the Ducatis will back in like a little bit in a straight line, but never quite to the apex. Whereas the KTMs, okay, usually all of them, but now nah, Pedro was backing in all the way to the apex, pretty much every lap. And I do think it's a benefit because it helps him stop. Um, so, yeah, that was the noticeable thing for me, the, the main thing. Um, like we always say, that the, it's, it's so close. Even Marini, who's in, in jokes, you, uh, disrespectfully, you say he's riding around like a track rider, track day rider. But obviously, it's just a joke because he's, his level is still extremely high. and and so on but yeah it's hard to notice these these things because it's so mm-hmm. close but there was a noticeable difference definitely and like you know that that was one key thing that i've noticed every time i've watched that the way the ducati sorts itself out electronically a lot better like yeah. you said it's you know people talk about backing in and as it banging down the gears you know it, it's all about you can set your engine braking you know your your thumb brake how much pressure gear ratio it, there's, there's so much to it but that ducati just seems to especially at a bumpy track like portimao where you know you break and you're on the bumps quite a lot it sorts itself out and from your voice note as well you just said brad and them brad and jack specifically you know, made a good step on Friday because we saw how fast both of them were, but they weren't able to carry on with that step. They kind of just hit a brick wall yeah. where Pedro just, you know, got better, got better, got better. And, yeah, yeah. and what amazed me with Pedro is he dismissed this. You know, I was watching the race going, oh, this guy's riding right on the ass of guys. Your front tire's going to overheat. You're not going to like, <laughs> oh, this guy, you know, your rear tire's going to be cooked. You know, oh, this guy's going to fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he never. So he kind no, of, no. again, rewind back to Mark Marquez. He's doing everything that said you weren't supposed to do on a MotoGP bike. And now, I, and I'll i be very surprised if they haven't, Brad, Jack, and a lot of the other MotoGP riders go and say, right, and, and sitting and watching and analyzing Pedro Acosta's stuff, even though he's the rookie and whatever, whatever, whatever. The yeah, fact yeah, yeah. He's finished third in his second race in the fastest MotoGP championship there's ever been. You know, you as, yeah. a, rider, you as a pro rider, you would want to go, right, what the hell is this guy doing that that we are maybe not doing or yeah. could do differently? Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would imagine from my point, I would be wanting to know. I mean, th- their guys are stuck, the best of the best, and that's why they get. I mean, I'm talking about the mechanics and technicians. So, I'd, I what I'd imagine is that the first thing would be said is that go look get get it because he's a factory KTM rider. His data will be freely available among amongst the KTM team. So, I'd imagine that the step would be what's different on his bike because in my opinion there was something different on their bikes whether it was new parts or i don't know i don't know what it was and um, brad didn't know either straight off the race so um because they did have some new parts but he wasn't sure what what pedro was running but in my opinion just to see how how visible it was and um, how obvious it was for me was that this there was different parts on the bike whether it was clutch or i don't know looked like clutch or engine brake system or something like that um but yeah that, that's what that's what i would want to know because i'm um, like i say at that level i wouldn't imagine jack is jack or brad are, are doubting themselves um doubting themselves their ability why can't we ride that fast um from us i'd imagine that they're saying to the well, their crew chiefs would probably be saying it as well but they're probably saying can you try see what different setups there were on the bike and then compare our laps and go go that route you know mm. um <clears throat> like point is um, looking at lap one to five, for example, but yeah, the, the latter part of the race, seeing where the differences are um, in speed, uh, in turn by turn, but then uh, seeing what their setup differences are, which is, uh, I mean, obviously the rider is is on the on the thing and and doing all the work of it, but yeah, you can only ride as as hard as what your bike's allowing you to. So, and their ability, um, 
they should they should have been a lot closer to Pedro, I believe. Yeah. Look, I mean, Michael Belosa says, yeah, you know, yes, but the weather wasn't hot. You know, that's that's maybe why Pedro didn't suffer with the front tire overheating in the rear. But but this is the difference. This is where again that mindset of Pedro not knowing maybe or not caring and and just taking a chance comes into yeah. play because you saw Mark Marquez and Pecco kind of play that that cat and mouse game where you know attack. Okay, I can't get past. I've got it back off to cool my front. It's become the norm in 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 a, yeah. in a Sunday MotoGP race. Whereas yeah, yeah. Pedro Acosta is going, well, let me see. You know, yeah, yeah. The beauty of Pedro Acosta in his rookie year, he can just say, well, let me see. I, I don't have to win a championship. I know everyone's yeah. kind of you know saying, oh, he might win the championship, but I don't have to. I could, I can crash next weekend, and people will still be talking about my podium. So he's got this open playbook that Pedro Acosta can just. Yeah play himself and and while the other riders are ingrained with you can't do this you can't do this you can't do this yeah, this, no, is no. Where, this is where the pedro exercise i think is beneficial to ktm because that's where jack was beneficial to ktm because they were yeah the ktm can't run soft tires you can't do this you can't do this jack came in with a different approach to the whole team and said okay well we're going to try it yeah yeah normally the, the austrians and the germans you know Gay Tim guys are like, no, 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 you can't stray away from the, the rule book, you know. Yes, like, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've yeah, created yeah. this rule book. Yeah. And that's where MotoGP is going now. That rule book has yeah. got to be changed. And these are what the riders are going to have to do if they want to stay with Pedro. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, you'll know as well, and I think a lot of people can take value from this as well, is that, you know, you tend to listen to the commentators and they do a fantastic job and they keep it exciting. These, but remember that their job is to keep it exciting. Hmm. And, um, when they tell you, oh, Mark Marquez is saving his tire and he's five seconds off the leader, that's that's absolutely impossible. The, yeah. the only time you'll be thinking like that or, or, or doing that is if you've actually been winning 12 races in a row, for example, or something like that, or or you're just behind the leader and you're biding your time to wait to see what happens with these tires. But if you're off the pace, it's not because you're saving your tire. I mean, everyone's trying their hardest out there. Jack wasn't off the pace. Um, whatever he was, five seconds off of Brad because he was trying to save his tire. They they all right. Brad wasn't um, that far behind Pedro because he was saving his tire. Mm -hmm. Um, they they all trying their utmost and they're on the ragged edge. So it's uh, unless you're in second place, riding behind, right behind somebody, you then you're saving the tire. But if there's seconds between the guys, there's no way they're saving their tires. So um, yeah, with when it comes when it comes down to things like that, yes, they can overcook their tires and these things, but. Everyone's trying their hardest from the, from the first lap. Some guys are a bit more nervous with a full tank because the front's a little bit, the bike handles a little bit different. But at the end of the day, they're all tr they're all trying to push that limit to, w without crashing. And um, yeah, like I say, unless they right together and there's tents in it, no one's saving their tires because if there's one second, they're trying their hardest to close that second. You know. Um, I like Adrian van Dalen's comment here. We got Adrian Maisien, Uncle Rob. Pedro was just on the gas and showed them it can be done. He didn't care or worry about the rule book. And that's exactly what on Semesian. Stephen Berry, commentators get $500 bonus each time they say rookie sensation. Um, it definitely does have that vibe of Mark Marquez all those years ago. And, and there definitely yeah. is comparisons. You can easily put it together. And I do think that Pedro, in, in a way, is that in that new breed of MotoGP rider that is going to change things. And guys are going to start, you know, at, at, which is just going to push MotoGP to another level and the way they uh, they ride and the way they set their bikes up and everything. So yeah, it's going to be yeah. interesting to see how the, the rest of the guys, you know, especially Brad, I know, you know, and I know people went afterwards and Pedro is going to take Brad's back to ride and Brad's over with. You know, I, I don't understand that. Yes, Pedro beat Brad on the weekend. Brad still is the number one KTM rider and knowing Brad and you know Brad and, and you would have spoken to him there. He would be like, yeah, it's not nice. It hurts. Never want to be none of you guys want to be beaten it's horrible it's how you react to it now and um yeah. and i think it's it's just going to put a fire up the arse of brad and and, and ktm and back in, in general so um you know talking about brad did you did you talk to him over the weekend you know what, what did he say and we you know fitness wise he's lost all this weight he's back down to his moto three and you know but but talking to him and, and me talking to him a couple of years ago you were always talking to a rider that was yeah, I want to win the championship, but you know he wasn't saying it like I'm going to win the championship. But certainly, Brad this year is talking like a rider that wants to win the championship and has this 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 aura about him that wants to go for it. So, you know, what kind of what did you pick out of of, of spending that time with Brad over the weekend? Yeah, I'm a big 
not a problem for Brad, obviously, um, but a problem for South Africans, most South Africans, I guess, is that we brought up very humble. We brought up with respect and we brought up with all these things. So when you're in the limelight, that doesn't do you justice because, I mean, not to say that Acosta is um, mm -hmm. arrogant or anything like that, but he, I mean, he, he um, how can I say, he, he, he won't shy away from saying himself that he did a good job and joking that he did a great job and joking how he, was passing Mark Marquez's first GP race. Whereas a South African, generally, I mean, you have your guys, generally they're not, not the fast guys, but you have your guys that, that will shout, shoot their mouth off. And But Brad is super humble. And what the guys need to remember is that what the cost is doing now, this first, this particularly the Portimao race, and the, where was it? Not to buy <laughs> Qatar. He did, he did a good job as well. Brad's been doing that since he started MotoGP, he's been riding at that level, but he's just humble and quiet and um, unassuming. Um, so probably that works against you um, when when it comes hard time for contracts and all that stuff, but you can't fault him in terms of delivering. Um, there's yet to be a guy that's consistently beating him on the same bike and that. Um, and when he's come from the Moto3 and Moto2 days, he's generally wiped the floor with any teammate he's had. Um, once he gets, obviously first year he gets to find his way and then after that, it's yeah, it's the same thing every time. So um, Pedro is obviously riding on a high, and I'm hoping that he can actually be a contender as well because that's going to only help Brad. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> like like I say, um, you can't take too much from what the media and all the stuff are blowing up about um, Pedro Costa and all that stuff because at the end of the day, Brad is doing the job, and yeah, this this one race, and I mean people act. People are, especially the international media were carrying on like Brad was last and Pedro won, you know. It was just a, a few seconds in it and, yeah, the guy did a fantastic job, but Brad did an amazing job under the circumstances because um, him and Miller with their good ability, like you said, they started the weekend immediately so fast, but obviously their bikes were just lacking a little bit, especially for Brad, for what he needs out of the bike because he's quite unique to the other riders in his riding style. And... Um, yeah, I mean, maybe he's lost a bit of weight, but the guy's been skin and bone since I uh, since I've known him. So he still he, he looks exactly the same to me. Um, and yeah, I don't think that I don't think he needs to change anything in his riding. His mentality is very strong, strong-minded. Um, like most South Africans, very strong-minded. And um, I think that as soon as they give him the materials, he's gonna be doing what Brad does best. Yeah. Mariska, I agree with your comment. Never mind what the media are saying. The so-called South African supporters are worse. And that, that is what, you know, gets to me. And, and Shez, you would have had it, you know, through your career as well. When you're on the podium in World Super Sport, you're the greatest invention ever. When you're crashing out of races, you're, you know, your career is over and you're the worst invention ever. It's just, it's just yeah. you know, South Africans... You know, I, in a way, I take it with a pinch of salt because I look at like the rugby. When the rugby guys lose, they're the biggest arseholes on the planet. When we win, the whole country is united. So it's just yeah. South Africans are very, very, very passionate. And uh, yeah. they yeah. sometimes show it a little bit too much and they've got to give themselves a 24-hour rule. I think that's a good lesson for a lot of people to learn on social media. Um, yeah. Shares, how impressed were you with that KTM? I know you say you didn't spend a lot of time in the pit box and that, but I'm sure you would have gone for a little tour and Brad would have given you a tour of his bike and stuff. I mean, high impressor, you can't, I don't know about you, but I I, I turn into jelly when I'm in, when I'm in that, that in that pit box and you see, I mean, first of all, Brad's team are just amazing guys. They're just so welcoming. You, you can see they just look up to Brad. They'll they'll die by the sword for Brad. They really are united with Brad. But that whole setup is just, you know, as a as a as a motorbike fan, as a racing fan, you can't help but get goosebumps and just turn into a bit of a kid in a candy store. Yeah, I mean, I, I raced for Yacht, um, which is an Austria team in the World Endurance Series for probably five years, and I still have a good relationship with them. And the Austrian guys were very similar to us South Africans in that sense, that they're very, like, um, they, they've got a really cool atmosphere about them. And, um, yeah, I think you can see that definitely in that team. Although they've asked for so many people to get the best out of their, their bikes, their machinery and that, they've got Italians in there, they've got everyone in there. But, yeah, they set, they set the tone for the atmosphere in there, and it's a really good atmosphere in there. Um, so, and I believe that's that's number one thing in a team should be the atmosphere that you bring around to keep everyone positive and especially the riders. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm definitely not a fan of this aero shit and traction control and all this crap. I hate it because it takes away from the riders, in my in my opinion. Um, but the reality is that it's that it is there. 
um and it's i mean it is cool it's cool that some some guy from a com that studied computers his whole life can develop the stuff that makes a bike go faster mm -hmm. um so it's really cool gadgets and stuff but yeah it's just not my thing i mean it's it's cool to see what see it all on the bike and that but it's like showing me a computer it doesn't doesn't excite me you know um the, the i mean imagine riding those bikes without all of that shit. imagine how exciting that would be um i guess it would make bigger gaps because then the rider's ability would be um uh, much more important mm. but yeah i mean take forget about the electronics and that which i don't agree i don't like in that era crap um the carbon fiber pieces that are like made it every little thing you can think of i mean it's just um yeah i don't know it's um unexplainable if you had if you had an endless amount of money and an endless amount of time and mechanics and everything you still couldn't come up with the stuff that they've got on that bike the little things that they've done the detail and the attention so um yeah they're, they're really cool and um i mean the ktm yeah, they've just honestly when you look at the ktm i think it's it's the best bike it's the best bike in with regards to that kind of stuff um i mean ducati are known to and I think there's a lot of stuff that's secret because, yeah, we all hear about the suspension drop and all this kind of stuff and these aero things and the front lock. We all hear about that when it's time for us to hear about it. But there's there's a lot of secret stuff, secrecy going on there that guys have got and developed that they don't want everyone to know. Mm -hmm. And I think Ducati is leading with regards to that. But K KTM is catching up very, very fast. And I think it's going to be it's a matter of time before KTM's the leader. And everyone's trying to follow what ktm are doing um i mean there's no doubt yamaha and honda are going to catch up because they so they're just so big and they're pouring so much money and they've got good riders so they are going to catch up but i think before they've caught up ktm is going to become the the leading brand you know you were talking you made mention there of the, you know the team environment and the atmosphere and the people you have in your box making a big difference to to how you perform as a rider in many ways um I was lucky enough to to have to spend the evening yesterday at a, at a meet and greet here in the UK with Cole Fogarty, Troy Bayless, and Glenn Irwin, who are obviously you know Glenn Irwin, current BSB Ducati rider, Cole Fogarty, Ducati legend, uh, world superbike champion, and of course Troy Bayless, who is my favourite non-South African racer of all time. Yeah. So, and, and and they both said you know the, the questions popped up of you know what were your biggest mistakes in your career and Fogarty said straight was you know leaving a winning team my team to go to Honda you know he saw pound signs he saw a free motocross yeah. bike he saw HRC he saw this you know at that stage Ducati was still very small although yeah. all the eight bikes but you know it wasn't a Honda so he kind of got sold by all of that you know he got all story eyed by it and he said yeah. it was the worst thing because he just never felt every time he walked in that pit box he just never felt like the team were working for him he didn't feel like it was his team you know and yeah. and, and, he, and he said he battled and as soon as he actually phoned Ducati back and said listen please take me back just just yeah, yeah. whatever it takes just take me back if you if i've got to get paid less or whatever whatever and troy baylor said the same you know he said unfortunately um when i when i went into the ducati motor gp project all those years ago with caparossi after two years you know a rider was on the line and it was always going to be the australian over the uh over yes. the the Italian rider, so he yeah, got, yeah. Asked, um, and then he was ready to call it quits, which, which I, I didn't actually know. I, I mean, I pulled a lot from Bayless last night, and it's a whole show in itself. But basically, he said, you know, decided to stay on, went to Camel Honda in MotoGP, and he, and he just said the same thing. He just, you know, especially the way the Japanese work compared to this Italian family team that he had been in, with yeah. which was pretty much all Carl's team, and you know, it felt like it was his team. He just sat in that Honda box, and you know, just was the odd one out. He just, you know, he just sat there by himself. And yeah, it showed yeah. the results because as soon as he went back to Ducati, he was winning races again. So that yeah. my point is that I think that's where Brad is with his team at the moment. That's the one big key factor that Brad's got with his team and KTM in general. KTM, you know, a couple of people has asked about the latest rumor that's come out that it's going to be Mark Marquez and the factory team next year and Brad and Jack in the gas gas team. Now, Brad's contracted to, to KTM yeah. So for, for the next couple of years. So theoretically, they could put him in the gas gas team if they wanted to because yeah. he's, he's, he's a KTM rider. They, he goes wherever they tell him to. Yes, yeah. I don't think it'll happen, 
Uh, and when I read that and see that, I kind of go, oh, rubbish. But then I do go, there is this big problem of this Mark Marquez that, that is performing. Okay, yes, we know what happened. At the time. He's showing his talent and is, is basically a rider up for grabs. Yeah. Now, if Ducati don't take him, you know, Mark's not going to want to be in a satellite team again next year. He's going to want no, no, no. next year. You know, so are Ducati going to offer him that in terms of the Pramac ride? If Martin goes to the factory team, does Mark go in there with the same kind yeah. of Martin deal? If not, <clears throat> KTM would be stupid not to take the Mark Marquez. It would be, it would yeah. be stupid. I think the Jack Miller to Gas Gas is already a done deal in, in my mind. If if he wants to stay in MotoGP at that level, uh, if, he, if he doesn't want to go to World Superbikes and replace... Alvaro Batista then and try and go for a World Superbike Championship. But um, what, what I'm trying to get at is I never thought Brad's Red Bull KTM colors was ever in jeopardy. But now I'm starting to think, you know, so this Mark Marquez and this Pedro Acosta are and, and are going to be a thorn in the side. Um, yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out, especially if the results keep going. You know, the more Pedro beats Brad, you know, the more fuel for the fire there is in that argument. Yeah, I mean, again, it comes down to the South African mentality. And Brad is not a material guy. He's not a, he doesn't care what people, I mean, it's not nice to hear things that people say about you when, when they're not positive and that, but I don't think he really cares about it and that. And if that, I mean, that's a big if, I think. Um, if it was to go that route, Brad would be on the best stuff there is, even if it's on a, whether it's a gas gas, doesn't matter. Look at Pedro beating all of them on a gas gas. So, um, and he's the newbie, shouldn't be getting the the best, even though they're all on the same stuff. Um, so I, I don't think that matters. I mean, the paycheck is what matters for for Brad and the, and the materials, and he's definitely going to be getting at least what he's getting now or better. So I, I don't I don't think it matters. I mean, it matters for when people start going. Oh, you see, they're kicking Brad down, and, that, and yes, it's it's a problem being being a South African because Pedro. I don't know. I don't even know if he's sponsored by Red Bull. I guess he is. Mm. <clears throat> Pedro and all these guys. Yeah, Brad sponsored by Red Bull, but he's just a South African with his um. How many how many South African how many Afrikaners did um Shalista Ron say there are six or something? <laughs> he's just some South African with six followers. So unfortunately, he gets the hand seat when it comes down to the money from Red Bull and all these kinds of guys. So, um, yeah, there's I mean, there's lots of politics and stuff, and <clears throat> people like Russell Wood and those guys would have been multiple world champions if, if it wasn't for politics. So, um, yeah, um, it's just the way it is. But uh, I don't know. I mean, KTM definitely wouldn't want to do it that way. Um, if it goes that way, they'll make sure Brad's on the best of the best, and he'll he'll still be outperforming them, I believe. Um, while, while, when you brought up Mark Marquez, that's another thing I actually noticed um, on the weekend is that his bike was notably practices all of the race, quite a bit slower than the other bikes, to be honest. Um, I mean, the Ducatis, he couldn't even hold the other Ducati slipstreams. Um, the KTMs, he could like sit their slipstream, but not come past him down the straight. So I, I, I'm not sure if that's the older bike or what the story is, but yeah, his bike was notably slower than the other bikes, definitely. So. I mean, maybe at a dud engine or something for that that round. But um, if he gets a bit more horsepower, he's going to be definitely stronger because, I mean, at that level, to still be so close that we're on a slow bark, um, I think if he gets a little, little bit more horsepower so he can just hang in there down the straights as well, he's going to be a weapon as well. Well, that's the argument with the whole Mark Marquez case. Is it's still early days. It's two races. He's still learning. Yeah. There's still a lot of improvement from Mark and that Ducati of his and the team so that yeah. and that's and that's why he's going to become more and more of a conversation as the year goes on because the results are going to get better and then it's going to be right this guy's too good for a satellite team we know that we know Marquez is too good for where he is at the moment yeah so where yeah. does he go Olimoto makes a good point you know Ducati factory team is monster energy Mark Marquez is Red Bull's boy you know do, do monster energy break the bank uh and tell Rossi to get lost and use Rossi money to to pay Marquez, does Marquez break that relationship to go? And that's why you can understand why you know all the media is is surrounding Mark going to, to, to KTM because it's Mark's been at KTM before, it's Red Bull, it's owned by Red Bull. Yes, yes. So you can understand why those kind of puzzles fall into place, but um Definitely. It, it's an interesting topic. There, there, there's no two ways about it. Um yeah. Darryl, someone asked a question here, and it's a very easy answer. Daryl Holmes, what is the difference between the KTM and the Pedro's gas gas? 
Um, Brad's KTM is painted orange and has Red Bull on it, and yeah. uh, Pedro's is red with gas gas and Red Bull on it. And I think yes, it's all four bucks. I mean, the two gas gas, the two KTMs are the same thing. I, I'm just guessing that um, the KTM Brad and um, Jack will get priority in terms of new parts and stuff. But I mean, they'll have if, if that's the case, Pedro and them will have it available the next round latest. So talking, of, talking of staying with the rider kind of transfer market, more big news that came out this week or end of no, this week. Um, Fabio Quattararo signing again with Yamaha, which I was surprised with initially. And then again, the more thinking you do, you know, the more you sit down and think about it, it's not a surprise. Um, 12 million euros a year to get paid to stay with Yamaha, two year deal, he snubbed a 4 million euro a year deal from Aprilia. Um, yeah. People are social. <laughs> went absolutely ballistic fabio greedy bastard taking the money how could you not think about winning races and championships and blah 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 again i i kind of gave myself the 24-hour rule before i replied and it's very simple cheers put yourself any anyone anyone in the comments anyone watching this anyone in the world in the world never never mind motorcycle racing in the world put yourself in this situation yamaha the mighty yamaha who mm -hmm. you have been with won a world championship with 12 million euros on the table. 12 million. Highest paid MotoGP rider on the grid. Aprilia, 4 million euro. Okay, yeah, Aprilia in a better place at the moment, um, pace-wise on the bike. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're smart, you're going to go, now people are saying, you jump to Aprilia. You've got to go to Aprilia, you know. It, yeah. it looked like that move was going to happen. But you look, at, you look at the numbers and you go, well, First of all, Fabio's not going to climb on an Aprilia and win the championship. It's not going to happen. Aprilia's yeah. not in yeah. a position to win a championship. Yeah, he'll win races and he might be a little bit more competitive. Yeah. But look at Miguel Oliveira. Look at Johnny Ray, uh, like you've just said, in with Yamaha and Yamaha. There's this, yeah. this is period of, of in introduction that you've got to go through. So Fabio's sitting there, and I, I, I'd go with Fabio's decision all day. Take the 12 million because yeah. you're going to get paid the most. Money, money matters, first of all. <clears throat> yeah. They have to get it right. Aprilia can only offer you so much that four million is never going to get any better. The bikes, you, there's always going to be restrictions with Aprilia because of the size of the company and resources. And, and, and you know, in, in some way, I think Aprilia has almost reached their level, like the limit. Um, yeah. It, it, they can't, they wanted a Fabio a rider like Fabio to try and take that next step, but resources and money wise, they don't four million for a motor yeah, 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 yeah. like Fabio, yeah, you're offering yeah. him four million. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I yeah, I can fully understand why Fabio's gone with the money compared to a more attractive Aprilia package now that's still not going to win you the championship though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean just quickly it does give um tribute to Marquez because of what he's sacrificed to just try and be competitive so again it just goes off to him but again it doesn't it's not always only up to the rider um you know quattro has got managers and people making a lot of money off of his earnings so you know it's not only his decision at the end of the day um but again yama between yama and honda i mean if they can if they can make the next i don't know if it's going to take them a year or three years to catch up if he's if he can mentally last that long without losing his ability um i think it's a good good stay definitely i mean it's it's money have you seen the expensive women's clothing that guys wears everywhere i mean he, need, he needs the money so um yeah it's a hell of a lot of money and with the one of the the strongholds in motorsport um being yamaha so um Definitely, uh, uh, Yamaha and Honda are going to start winning. It's just a matter of time, and you don't know how long it's going to take. You know, you 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 say that though. I look at Yamaha and I go right with Rins and more so Rins. Quattararo was kind of on the fence because I didn't know where he was mentally at. And as you yeah. said, it's this the Fabio and Yamaha that relationship working depends on Fabio's mental status of right. Are you going to be patient enough for another year, two years, maybe? Yeah. To stick yeah. It out? Before Yamaha is competitive again, I think Rins, I think Rins is, is is more than happy there. I think everything lines up for Rins. He's on a good paycheck. He's in a factory ride. I think Rins will be there for a while. He's he's good at developing a bike. He's already made it a step forward, better than you know what Fabio could do the whole of last year. Okay, there's more resources yeah. being thrown into it. So Yamaha, I look at that and I go, other than having a second team on the grid, which they need for more information and whatever, they're on the right path. Honda, I worry about because I don't think Mia and Marini 
I know, yeah. I know Marini's got that patience and he's not going to crash the bike. And I've said it, he's not going to crash the bike. He's not going to override the bike. So he's bringing the bike home, getting data. Yeah. But if you match up those two rider pairings, Yamaha in the better situation. Yeah. Okay, the, the level's too high for them for an attitude like that, unfortunately. The level's yeah. too high for an attitude like that. So, it, And it another thing we've been saying for, for years now, um, yes, Yamaha, I have a Cal Crutcher who's a talent of, he's an alien also. Or was an alien also, but when they when he does a wild card or a test, he's miles off of the lead Yamaha riders. Ducati has uh, Piro, who yeah. when he does a wild card is tenths off of the lead riders, and that's their test rider. Yeah. I mean, KTM have Pedrosa who comes in and beats everybody. You know, it's those are the two guys that are ma leading the way in with technology and performance. And yeah, I don't I don't see the other guys with anybody. I mean, Hondas have. A joke when it comes to that to be honest yeah. fast cars and and all that and they can do lots of laps so that to see how much how long an engine lasts but that doesn't that doesn't win the races you know they need if test riders because the riders themselves are limited with um, how much time they can spend on their race bikes um <clears throat> they need to they need to somehow find an alien as a test rider because the guys that are that are heading heading the way have got that they they do need to, you know, and, and a Casey Stoner kind of rings to mind for Honda because, you know, they had him on the books. He's He's been there, done yeah. that. Again, how does he translate to the new style of modern day MotoGP riding? You know, he was also the, the rider that didn't want the, you know, the, you know, the electronics. Yes, yes, the yes. School. So it, it's a tough balance to find. Mm -hmm. and, and in that way, I do feel a bit for Honda and Yamaha in many ways because there aren't many options out there. For no, them. no. Um, you know, Zarco, Zarco was signed from Honda to basically become that role. Um, yeah, yeah. They haven't signed him for that reason. They're, they're, they're stupid. But um, anyway, I just look at the Honda. Yeah, and I do. I, I, I worry. Uh, Yamaha definitely need another team, as Stephen Berry <coughs> mentioned. So, uh, yeah. Valentino Rossi, who's a Yamaha, Yamaha ambassador, he's going to Jerez now for the Yamaha experience with all the Yamaha customers, still using that Yamaha money to buy Ducatis, and he's still not going yeah. to buy. Yamaha's next year. He's won. Well, yeah, yeah. Yamaha's. We will give you Yamaha's. You don't have to yeah. pay millions for Ducatis. No thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll buy Ducatis. So that's their biggest problem. Until they start showing performance gains, um, they're not going to be able to actually make the performance gains they need, if you know what I mean. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a tricky one, but I, I've, I've always gone back to exactly what you've just said. Testing only counts if you're doing it at a high level. If yes, Brad yes. is riding around with World Superbikes at Jerez and fourth or fifth behind World Superbikes, <laughs> exactly. What, what is the point? And and I mean yeah. again, I mean that with the most respect I possibly can. But what are Honda gaining out of that? Yeah, I, even Aprilia, they actually surprise me that they that they do these. Okay, it's not very consistent, but it's, they surprise me that they do these these performances they do because I mean their test rider. And again, it's ne it's never disrespect to the riders. It's just the fact that they're not at that level. Is that Lorenzo Salvadori, and I mean, he was my teammate for two years. I, I know the guy well, but he's their test rider. I, I don't actually know how they how they pull out these performances. Um, but one million percent, that is that is a massive factor because, like, like you see, when when the KTM and the Ducati test riders do a wild card, they are super fast. I mean, and now KTM have Paul as well. I mean, he's another. He's on the verge of being an alien as well. It's also he was he was top dog on the KTM for a long time and then unfortunately injuries and all that stuff. But <clears throat> as you saw in those preseason tests, was it Sepang or Herez or somewhere? Yeah, I mean he was second fastest KTM yeah. as mm -hmm. a test rider again. So I mean, yeah, I, I think that's that's the next step those guys need to do is take a guy that's an alien in MotoGP and try and con pay him as much as the GP riders just to just to do the practice. Well, I think Aprilia are on the right track. I think Aleish needs to take that test okay. role up next. Because, you know, like Zarko in a race weekend now is, is testing. Uh, yeah. Aleish is still going for it. But, you know, your mindset on a race weekend is not in test mode. So, yeah, you know, yeah. Zarko's not sitting there. You can't tell me Zarko in a race weekend is in test mode. You, you can't. They need no, to do no. those test weekends and say, right, <clears throat> no, there's no pressure. Don't look at the timesheet. Don't worry where you are. You know, because Aleish yeah. and, and Zarko will be coming in looking at that timesheet. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm a test rider, but fuck us, I don't want to be 18th, 19th, 17th, 14th. No, no, so they no. need to take they need to take Honda have gone right by doing Zarko, but they need to take him out of that racing environment. And your your sole mm -hmm. job is when we go testing is to test. 
Yeah. And they, your sole job is to test at the fastest pace you can. Yeah. That's what yeah, we yeah. need. And we're yeah. not getting it from our guys at the moment. But, you know, this, again, it's a, it's something I've thought about a lot lately is, you know, Nakagami is the test rider in race weekends. And I was always one that said race weekends are the best place to test because you're testing in that environment. But yes. at the same time, it's not because... It's too cutthroat, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, there's too much going on, especially now yeah. with sprint races on. So how can yeah, you yeah, yeah. It's on the Look test. at Brad and Jack at Portimao. I mean, they had some some cha minor changes and <clears throat> their performance was definitely lacking just from some minor changes. So, yeah, it's, it's too competitive now these days to be trying new thing, new things on race weekends. It needs to come into the race weekend proved already, proven anyway, like a Piro does when he goes testing on a new part. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, maybe maybe what, Br what Brad and Jack have on the bike is just wasn't working now, but it's going to work eventually. But yeah, the, the key has to be that you have a rider and take a rider out when he's still hungry. So when he goes testing, in his mind, he wants to go faster than, than, than the factory riders, you know. Um, not, not take a guy out of retirement and say, oh, okay, I'll come and do your testing because you're going to pay me 6 million euro to do a, be a test rider. You need, to take someone, you need to take someone out while they believe that they're still the best, so essentially. Um, and then you're going to get the best out of it, yeah. So looking at the, again, the rider market now, Jorge Martin irritated me a couple of weeks ago with, with his comments of, if I don't get a factory ride, I'm gone. A factory to carry ride, I'm, I'm, I'll go somewhere else to get a factory ride, which was a silly statement to make because, okay, well, what are your options now? A yeah, Prilia. Yeah. You, you, you have a Prilia and it's going to be a wage cut, a performance cut. You know, yeah. As, as talented as Jorge Martin is, he's not going to go to Aprilia and, and, and beat the Ducati guys. He's, he's just not going to. No, no, no. Well, I think Ducati have got him by the balls. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to see how Ducati play this out because Ducati are one that don't normally like to be threatened by their riders in many ways. We've seen them cut no, Lorenzo no, no, no. early on in a season. We've seen them get rid of Stowe. You know, we've seen Ducati yeah. make some big and, – and I heard it from Bayless you know, um, last night as well. Okay, he had retired. He was back home in Australia. Ducati basically came to him, and he and he was pretty open about it last night. And he said, Ducati came to me and said, if I don't run an on an Australian superbike team and I ride in it, they're going to take like my Ducati ambassador money and roll away from me. It was yeah, wasn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's how ruthless Ducati. Oh, yeah, they're yeah, looking yeah, nice yeah. On the outside, and that, that's yeah. fucking ruthless. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna be keen to see how they play this. Do they play Martin's bluff and say, "Cool, you know what? Piss off. We'll take." We'll, I think we'll they make, will. Yeah. We'll make the Mark Marquez thing work because Mark, yeah. yes, he's a Red Bull athlete, but so is Martin in the Premac team. Yeah. Will Mark be? Yeah, I know Mark will want to be on a factory red Ducati, but you know what, Mark, you can go win a world championship in Premac colors, be the first rider if Martin doesn't do it this year to win on a satellite independent team. Win on a Ducati that Rossi wasn't able to do. You know, I think those kind of cards, that's how I would be selling it to Mark Marquez if I was yeah, his agent. Yeah. He's yeah. saying, right, bit more money, but forget about the red Ducati. Let them sort themselves out if they take Martin. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. That Pramac ride, you stay with Red Bull, you can win. And, you know, to go and win on a factory Ducati, people go, oh, that's brilliant from Mark, but it's expected. You know, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ducati for God's sake. Mark on an independent bike, even though it's a factory bike in those colours, you know, yeah. I, I think that could be a good option for him. Yeah, I think so too. And I think, um, yeah, Ducati have always been like that. They put their eggs in one basket and they, that that basket is uh, big nigh at this stage. So I honestly don't think that they're actually phased about No, I don't think they're going to, um, you know, make miracles happen to get Martin or Marquez into their team, to be honest, because they believe that the, their bike is winning with big nigh, So just keep that formula. They're not too phased about the second rider. I mean, you look back to the days where it was Fogarty winning all the races in Superbike or Bayless winning. You know, their teammates were, yeah, okay, good. It's the odd good performance from Azaz or, so, or someone. But, yeah, they always focused everything on 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 their one number one rider. And I think they've got that now. So unless there's chances of Bagnaya going somewhere, I don't think they're actually going to rock the boat to um to get other guys in there because, Again, they're dealing with emotions and trying to keep uh, the morale up. So by making this big fuss to get a Marquez or a Martini in, they worried, I'm sure it's going to fluster Bagnaya. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to go that route. And like you say, the logical one for Martini is to stop shouting his mouth because 
when it comes down to it and he realizes he has to stay in um, um, the current team, you know, he's going to have to eat eat um, humble pie. Well, his only options are, I mean, there's talk that Bastianini could make the jump to Aprilia, which in some ways I could see happen because <clears throat> Bastianini, I've always said, you know, from what I've seen of him in the paddock and, and, and being closely associated with Grassini and seeing how he's, he's very, he's a very conservative kind of natured rider. I, I, I think that Ducati factory environment's a little bit too bullish for him in yeah. many ways. You know, I think Aprilia would be more comforting to, to him and he would be out of the the, the Bagnaia shadow. I, it all yeah. depends how Bastianini performs this year. Uh, we'll make that decision because at the moment, he's, he's still, we know what happened last year with his injuries and that, so he's still yeah, finding yeah. his confidence and his form. So over the next couple of races, it's going to be interesting to see if it is this Bastianini who's, okay, I'll play second fiddle to Bagnaia or yeah. If it's Bastianini that, well, fuck that, I'm going to win races and, and take it by the ball, you know, the bull by the horns and go for this. But I could see a, a situation where Bastianini moves to Aprilia, Martin into the factory team, Mark into Premac, uh, or as, you, as we say, Bastianini staying put in the Ducati factory team because Ducati like having this Bastianini that they could almost, you know, puppet on strings. And you sit yeah, there, yeah. and Yaya's a number one, you get the odd good result. We're happy with that, Martin. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Go try and beat us on an Aprilia. Uh, yeah. Um, where I do, where was I going with this now? I had such a good, such a good argument. Now it's just gone out of my head. Um. Well, I, what I can, while you're thinking about that, old man, is um, Bastianini. I can see Ducati just staying as is because there's no doubt Bastianini showed showed signs of brilliance again this weekend or whatever the last uh, race at Portimao. Um, and I think his his results are going to get better again. Um, he's sometimes inconsistent, but I think he's going to start mm, doing good things again. And I think that I think that factory team will 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 stay as is. Um, the nice thing about both those Italian riders, and it's you don't see it often in the Europeans, um, but they're both pretty humble and really really confident, but quietly, you know. Um, Bagnaia also, you have to take your hat off to him. He always he's always quietly confident, mm -hmm. doesn't shut his mouth. Or, whereas Martin shows those signs of like you know spilled breath syndrome or whatever. So. Um, no doubt he deserves a factory ride. Um, but yeah, uh, looking at it from Ducati's point, I'd imagine they're hoping that Bastianini is just going to carry on with his little bit of progress and be be winning races and a supportive second all the time. So um, yeah, I, I don't I don't see that factory team changing unless Bastianini starts falling falling off the plot. Yeah. So where I was going to take it, uh, sorry, Johnny Martins, we we have spoken about the Costa Marquez to KTM and Brad going to the satellite team. So if you just want to watch this afterwards, about 20 minutes ago, we were talking about it. You can catch up with it there. My my question to you, Shares, was going to be regarding that number one rider and number two rider in a team. You were obviously in a team with uh, Ken and Sofoglu in World Supersport. Um, Sofoglu was Mr. World Supersport at that stage. Did He won the World Championship that season with you, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So... We've always heard about this number one rider in a team and a number two, okay? But a team like yours with a very fast Sheridan Morais and a very fast Kenan Sofoglu, Ducati now with a very fast Bastianini, a very fast Benyaya. Did you, or is there this sense of, right, Kenan, you're number one, Shez, you're number two. And, and how do you, how is that managed? I mean, how do you know, what are the signs that, that kind of show that, Right, Kenan's number one and you're number two. Is it a case of, right, you come in and shares, right, you're faster than Kenan. Okay, well done, shares, but shut up. How are we going to make Kenan foster? Is, you know, how does it, how does that kind of environment play out and, and how's it managed? Yeah, I think it doesn't really, I mean, it, the, their level is way higher than super sport and that. And even in super sport, it was, we had kind of two teams within a team. So you never really felt it. Um, the shots would get called behind the scenes with, in turn, with regards to engines and stuff, but, yeah, um, I don't. I don't think that happens. I think it's more of like a um, a mental. Um, what? How can I say? Like a. It's like an atmosphere that gets set. You know, it's not necessarily that they'll get different parts because two factory riders will always be able to get the same parts at that level. It's not like oh shit, we don't have forty thousand euro to give you the next level of swim arm, so only Bagnai is getting it. They th there's there's no budget there. So, yeah. um, I, I think like. What you're getting at to answer your question is that if if there's a um, B rider or whatever, their second rider, I think it would just be like a um, 
an aura almost like mm. a, a mm. just a, a sense of it in the pits you know um it would never be you number two unless it's coming for the championship and bastianini's eight in the championship but competitive for that last round and Bagnar's fighting for the championship i don't think that ever be like listen remember you number two you got to fight for for the main man yeah so i don't i don't think it's ever like that unless it's coming to a championship or something obvious like that yeah so i look at that ducati i mean every shot you see you see uh um uh you know you see a, a lot of the ducati hierarchy a lot of the time on on peko banyaya's side and look in, in many ways why shouldn't it be peko's won yeah. two world championships you know at, at some stage yeah. you earn your status you know yeah, yeah. I've, I've always had that argument with people saying oh you know lorenzo kind of knocked rossi out of the team and well yeah because he was faster than rossi at, at that stage yeah. and, and yeah, rossi yeah. wasn't happy so he went to ducati and you know wasted two two years that he could have won his 10th world title you know yeah. so in many and i know this is probably going to blow up the internet and i'm probably going to get you know bags of dog shit put out of my outside my front door for saying this <laughs> but anyways and, and i think i still firmly believe in in 10 20 years time rossi will have an honest sit down conversation with someone you know like a jerry springer show or something and he'll come out and say yeah, you know what i did I, I i threw away my own career in in many ways i kicked marquez off the bike which cost me my world championship yeah. i um i did i had sour grapes when lorenzo came in as as the first kid and yamaha kicked me out so i went to ducati yeah. i think he kind of already admits that but there's a lot of things that kind of lined up yeah, that, yeah. you know in, in in that in that sense but again from the fogarty bayless conversation last night exactly what you said it was all about that aura it wasn't necessarily that you were number one you're number two but you could definitely sense that you know when you're sitting there and, and i don't know if you made note of it but i know like fogarty and, and bayless said it a couple of times you know especially when bayless had bostrom coming in and zaus coming in who were yes. his marketing tools you know he said they were good looking guys ben bostrom american ruben zaus this all action spanish guy you know yeah yeah, yeah yeah australian that started his career late you know so he was yeah he, he could easily just be thrown in the dustbin you know he was yeah yeah, yeah. It easily dispense with him, whereas yeah, the yeah. good-looking guys, you know. So Bayless, and, and and at one stage Bayless said, even even though he was world champion, he was threatened by these guys because there was a lot of attention being put on them. Yeah, that yeah. maybe the factory weren't seeing, but certainly Bayless was sitting there going, "But hang on, guys, I'm winning the races and winning the world championship, but here, you know, all the advertising boards on the outside are of this guy, and I open up magazines and it's Zas sliding, and it's so it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, those yeah. Little things, and that's where I think. Yeah, how Bastianini takes it, and, and this is where Martin Martin wants to be the poster boy. So Martin wants to be the Banyaya. Yes, the, yes, and, yes. And that's, why, and that's why he's got his back up about it. But yeah. this is where my argument with Bastianini is now: Is he going to be happy to be to not have that attention and just stay on his Ducati and prove people wrong every now and then by beating Banyaya and 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 end? Or is he going to be, you know what? I want to be my own poster child, so I'm going to go to Aprilia and be a poster child. It's, it's all the things yeah. on it. I, I think he like i say he comes across pretty humble and stuff so i think he I, i'm sure he's hoping to stay on the factory bark but yeah i think he'll i think he's going to hang tight in the factory i hope for his sake he does actually um i mean it's always lucky to see a, 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 a change up and all these different guys going to different teams and that but yeah i hope it stay stays as is and um yeah <laughs> i guess it's going to upset the apple cart that somewhere else if, if it does stay like that but um yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking it's going to stay like that. Eh? So predictions for Kota this weekend shares. We know that Mark Marquez is, you know, the king of Kota. He, he you know, he rode there with half an arm a couple of years ago and he was competitive. Um, he's done magical things there. I, I can't remember who mentioned it a couple of weeks ago in, in the comment section. Um, I think it was Sven Grinner, maybe. He said, you know, everyone's kind of planting the seed that Mark's going to win it anyway because now he's on a better package than a Ducati. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the Honda was always, and Mark always set it up front end biased, you know. Yes, he, yes, he yes. always rode the Honda on the front end. Yeah. He hasn't quite got that yet with the Ducati. It's still getting there. No. Um, the Ducati wasn't as agile as, as the Honda. Coat is a very agile track when you really pick it apart. You know, so there's, so there's a lot there's a lot of work for, for Mark on the Ducati to do to, to be kind of put in the, the frame of, yeah. the, you know, go there and, and win the race. But, um what, what, how do you see this weekend planning out? I mean, look, MotoGP's got to the point where you know you could put ten. You just riders, don't know. Yeah, yeah, you could put ten riders in a hat and say pick one and and yeah, you know, yeah. 
that's how it's going to be. But you know, indications from Portimao leading into this weekend, still in the early stages of the season. You know, <clears> who's <throat> going to perform? Who's not going to? Um, Brad, Brad strongly, Brad strongly. The KTM's are fast, so and I have no doubt that that team will figure out what was going on in Portimao. So I think the KTM's will have a strong, strong showing. Um, Jack's race pace, um, you know, historically hasn't been great. Always got pace, but not his race pace towards the end of the race. But he's worked hard on it this year, and I mean, even in Portimao, he was behind Brad, but his race pace was much stronger. Um, and I mean, if if Markson got a stronger engine there. No doubt, you can count him, count him in for 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 the win. But yeah, yeah, I mean, as much as he loves that place and that his engine was a bit down at um, Portimao. So if it's the same, if it's if it's the same there, uh, he's going to have it tough for sure. But like you say, there's, I mean, even Rince, who was a back mark at some races last year on the Honda, he won there. So yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a tough call for sure. And last question for you, shares one that I that I asked Troy and. Um... Uh, Carl Fogarty last night is because obviously the topic came up of you know Troy's heroic. I think Troy's still the last world superbike rider to to win on a MotoGP bike. Um, yep. I think there was ten speeds as well. But you know Fogarty had the wild card on the Kajiva at Donington, finished all just off the podium, and yeah, it was very entertaining. I mean, you can understand why Fogarty was was as dominant as he was. He's he was very entertaining, but, uh, you know, a lot of people here in the UK that I've met have said, you know, he's a complete idiot. He's so arrogant. And, but you know what? That's that's why he's – and, he, and he, he makes no bones about it. He, You know, last night, like, every single comment was, yeah, but they only beat me because they were on better bikes, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Still, which, yeah. which is entertaining, but it, it, it was it was great. But the question was, has, has that gap now between World Superbikes and MotoGP just got too big. And has that interest of World Superbike riders going to MotoGP kind of fallen away? We we talk about top bracket going. People say, oh, yeah, no, now he's back and he's doing well. He must go back. W would you want to yeah. go from... I don't know. I think you you have to be a kid. Eh? Look at look at, look at at the, the Binders, for example. They've been over there since um, since they were little babies, you know. Um, and, and Brad has just cut it, you know. He just made it. Um, it's it's that it's that fine of a fine of a line, and I mean, there's no doubt the the ability. I think a Johnny Ray, if he got in there as a kid, he would have won MotoGP titles coming out of his ears. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, he didn't. And to to make that cut, you need time because those bikes are so different. I mean, I just rode a Moto Two bike, not even a MotoGP bike, and the bike was so so weird to ride. You know, it was like like riding a pocket bike. It felt, felt like it had no suspension. They're just so rigid and and different. Um, so a GP guy coming to a normal bike, okay, they always train on normal bikes and super bikes and super sport bikes. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, but they've grown up racing on little one two fives to the motor threes, and it's all, always been based upon the same thing. So yeah, I mean, it would be cool to see top, top rec go there and get get a lot of time on a GP bike. But oh, I think it's at his age, he was a kid, yeah. But mm, it's going to be tough to do it at at that age because you're going to need years it's not a, it's not like it used to be where a super bike rider could just climb on a bike and go now these things ride themselves in 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 many ways you know with all this aero and electronics and stabilizers and yeah oh, there's there's so much shit going on them um i don't see it being being um fruitful for any any super bike rider um going to to gpa and i know there's talk of bmw and another head of bmw came out saying they're entertaining the idea and that and I love I love the thought of it, but realistically, BMW are what, 10, 15 years away. They they haven't really cracked it in World Superbikes yet. Okay, top racks starting to to break break into it yeah. now. But you know, they haven't done enough in World Superbikes to to show any kind of signs that they're gonna be even remotely successful in, in MotoGP. So and 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 is Top Rack gonna have the energy to do that? Is he gonna you must understand they'll BMW will go there and Top Rack's gonna be riding a pile of crap for two years you know a top yeah. is not going to want to do that when he can win in world two bucks so it, it, there's a big conversation around it and, and and troy and cole last night pretty much had the same sentiments like in their situation uh, if you put them in top rack shoes they wouldn't go anywhere less travel less That's media true. less everything what's that oh. has sheridan been abducted now It's not a good sight. It's like something out of a movie, isn't it? 
that really is like something out of a what was that horrible movie where the camera just goes off shares fell off the chair i hope not yeah paul paul tell me battery dead okay shares is battery dead so that's fine let me just say no problem tell him thanks we can finish okay well at, at least he's not abducted by um portuguese gang or something thankfully um but anyway that is he lost the front <laughs> she's got a hijacked must be aliens Stephen berry i love it um it was scary uh a cosmic surf it was scary it kind of looked like he was telling you know us south africans are on edge all the time you know even yeah in the uk when the amazon guy comes to my door to deliver something and he doesn't knock the right way i think you know i must get my machete out and start cutting heads off you um it did look scary <laughs> what is that movie man that i'm thinking of you know where they're walking and he's got the camera and he's like it's not coming out and he drops it and blair witch project the blair witch project seemed like the blair witch project um so anyway that great insight that's really why i wanted to get shares on the show it's always great chatting with shares because he um he's honest says it like it is you know he doesn't doesn't hide anything he's been there he's been at that level okay not motor gp level but you know we all know the success that shares has had so it's been great catching up with my best mate who i haven't physically seen for almost two years now um i'm, I'm really hoping to get out to um the ball door this year to to spend the weekend with him and and catch up with steven winnendahl as well he's racing in world endurance um the bastards steven i agree that bastards um but yeah, it's, it's it's been great catching up with Shares, and we'll definitely have him on the show again sometime um, to just get all that kind of information again. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, don't worry. Again, I say it every time. You can put the lawn mowers away, the garden tools, because MotoGP is back this weekend. So we can get uh, back to, to, to that. Can you see my Bayless helmet there? Signed, Rob, to Rob, you the man. Troy Bayless, like as I said, other than Shares, Brad, Darren, South African riders, Troy Bayless was my is my ultimate ultimate hero. I, I got weak knees last night um, hanging out with him. What a fantastic guy, legend. So, uh, but anyway, thank you to you um, for tuning in. Um, I hope we entertained you, and we'll catch up with you next week Tuesday after what I'm pretty sure it's going to be a very, 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 very exciting weekend. Oli Moto, you asked me about if I'll be at Brands Hatch. For Rossi, I'm trying to. I'm trying everything. I'm trying to actually get a press pass um, that I can get in there and actually try and do a, you know, laugh with Rossi on four wheels type segment. Uh, if not, I'll see if I can get a ticket and, and come join you. So I'll let you know, um, and then we can definitely hook up so I can see, um, so I can meet the man who causes, who stirs the pot in the comments here with, with everyone with, with factual comments to to be honest so again thank you everyone have a great uh, rest of your week and we'll see you um next week tuesday goodbye